Good morning, everyone. My name is Stacy Goddard, and I'm the Paula Phillips Bernstein 58th Faculty Director of the Albright Institute for Global Affairs at Wellesley College. And we are absolutely delighted to have you join us for today's event, Women in Diplomacy, a conversation with female former foreign ministers. I wanna say a quick thank you for all of those who have been involved in arranging this event. Um, and I wanna say I'm especially grateful to our technology staff for getting this up and running. And I also want to say a thank you to the Aspen Ministers Forum, which is Secretary Albright is going to explain is really integral to the genesis of the event today. We are so happy to be hosting this forum. The mission of the Albright Institute is to educate students. They are equipped to engage in global leadership. We're committed to the idea that gender equality is vital to addressing the most pressing global challenges, whether or not we're talking about meeting the challenges of climate change, of economic inequality, of fascism, we believe it is necessary not only to have women at the table, but to emphasize how all of these issues intersect with questions of gender inequality. Our commitment, of course, reflects the mission of Wellesley College, our home, which as a historical women's college remains dedicated to educating our students to make a difference in this world, and in particular, to take the lead in addressing the challenges of gender equality, inequality. And our mission also reflects the commitment of Secretary Madeleine Albright, whose deep dedication to the advancement of women has informed the entirety of her distinguished career and continues to do so today. All of the women who are joining us in the panel today are extraordinary examples of women's leadership in global affairs, and I'm honored to introduce them. First, I'm thrilled to welcome Marie Eugenia Vizela de Dia, trained as a lawyer, she served as Minister of Foreign Affairs for El Salvador from 1999 to 2003. She earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Geneva where she studied French as well as a degree in French language and civilization for the Sorbonne in Paris. She went on to study law where she graduated with honors and earned on from there, went on from there to earn a master's degree in business administration from the Central American Institute of Business Administration. Her biography includes a list of firsts. She was the first woman to become president of a private bank and an insurance company in El Salvador, as well as the first woman to sit on the board of the Central American Institute of Business Administration. And she currently heads the firm Inversions Vision, her executive coaching and consulting firm. She remains dedicated to serving in service positions and mentors the next generation of women leaders. We are honored to have you here today. Second, I'm delighted to introduce Susanna Malcora, who is the Dean of IE School of Global and Public Affairs and was previously Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Argentina starting in 2015. She began her corporate career as systems engineer at IBM, eventually becoming the CEO of Telecom Argentina. She left Telecom in 2002 and in 2004 joined the United Nations World Food Program, where she became the Chief Operating Officer. In May 2008, the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed her Under Secretary General of the Department of Field Support. And in her work as Chief of Staff of the UN Secretariat's Office, she handled complex negotiations with diplomats in various countries. She coordinated the mission to eliminate Syrian chemical weapons, as well as dealt with the first ever Ebola emergency response in West Africa. She has received numerous recognitions during her UN tenure, as well as as a foreign minister, and she continues to advocate fiercely for women's leadership in global affairs. Ms. Malcora, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Third, I'd like to introduce Margot Wallström, who from 2014 to 2019 was Sweden's Minister of Foreign Affairs, where she spearheaded the country's feminist foreign policy. She also served as Sweden's Minister for Nordic Cooperation beginning in May of 2016. She's been Special Representative to the UN Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict, and she's a former vice president of the European Commission and chair of the Council of Women's World Leaders Ministerial Initiative. Her distinctions include being voted commissioner of the year by the European Voice newspaper in 2002. And she's received numerous awards for her work on rights as well as environmental and European issues. Welcome to you, Ms. Wallstrom. Our next speaker I have introduced several times and I have to say it never gets old. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Secretary Madeleine Albright to our panel. A graduate of Wellesley College in 1997, Secretary Albright was named the first female Secretary of State and became at that time the highest ranking woman in the history of the United States government. She has previously served as US permanent representative to the United Nations as well as member of the president's cabinet. And in 2012, Secretary Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom 
our nation's highest civilian honor from then President Obama. She currently serves as chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group. She's a professor of the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University. She also chairs the National Democratic Institute, serves as the president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation, and in all of that spare time is a seven-time New York Times bestselling author. She is also continues to work as a dedicated mentor and advocate for her colleagues, as well as for the next generation of women's leaders, both at Wellesley College and beyond. Thank you once again for joining us here at the Albright Institute Secretary. And now I want to introduce the moderator of our panel, the president of Wellesley College, Paula Johnson. President Johnson has dedicated her career to advancing, promoting, and defending the education, wealth, and health of women. Before coming to Wellesley, President Johnson founded and served as the inaugural executive director of the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology, and was chief of the Division of Women's Health, both at Brigham and Women's Hospital, a Harvard teaching hospital, and one of the world's leading academic medical centers. Her research in healthcare models and training programs of the Connor Center have had an impact on women across this country and around the world by helping to shape healthcare and health policy reforms. Her work has influenced and educated emerging leaders beyond the borders of the United States for all those who seek to improve the health of women. Most recently, President Johnson helped spearhead Massachusetts Governor's Baker Higher Education Working Group and helped all of our campuses get back to work during the COVID pandemic this year. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, and has been recognized as a national leader in medicine by the National Library of Medicine, and recently received the Stephen Smith Medal for Distinguished Contributions in Public Health by the New York Academy of Medicine. On a personal note, I have to say that every day, I and other members of the Wellesley Communicate benefit from her visionary leadership and her dedication to fighting inequality in all of its forms. It is my great honor to turn this panel discussion over to President Paula Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Goddard. Um, that was uh, really beautiful introductions and I am so honored not only to serve as president, but particularly honored today to uh, moderate this phenomenal discussion with, with four truly um, amazing leaders. So I am going to ask all of our panelists to now turn on their cameras. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna begin before I uh, ask uh, Secretary Albright to talk to us a little bit about the, the genesis of this gathering, uh, just to say that we've all agreed to keep this informal. And so I am gonna call everyone by their uh, first names. And um, it is such an honor to be able again, to be here with you. So Madeline, I'm gonna turn it over to you to just share with us a little bit about the genesis of um, this gathering today. Well, first of all, President Johnson, Paula, thank you very, very much for everything you do and to Stacy and Rebecca and everything that is connected to the Albright Institute. I'm very proud uh, that it exists at my college, which I adored and has made all the difference in my life. So let me explain this. What happened when I was Secretary of State, I did something really modern. I invented the first international telephone conference call. That may surprise a few people in the audience. Um, and what I did was every day during the war in Kosovo, I spoke to a small group of foreign ministers on an open line about what was going on. Then when we were out of office, I started getting calls. The first one from um, Robin Cook, who had been the foreign secretary in the United Kingdom saying, Madeline, things are terrible, do something. And so um, I thought, well, I'll create a group. And so I decided that we would create a group of former foreign ministers. And then we needed an umbrella organization for it. And I'm on the board of the Aspen Institute. And so we managed to create it under the uh, roof of Aspen and its official name is the Aspen Ministers Forum. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. Uh, we're actually uh, a rock group, um, but we, we meet now, we've been meeting for about 20 years. The meetings are incredible. Uh, we talk without our national positions and really are able to exchange views 
um, in a very open way. And recently we've been dealing with issues such as cyber threats and generally artificial intelligence and kind of looking at various issues. And I'm truly, truly um, grateful and honored that my sisters here have uh, joined in terms of having a conversation with all of you. So thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful to you. And I know that our audience is in for a big treat as you answer Paula's questions. Yep. Madeline, thank you. And thank you for, for starting what is a, what must be just a fascinating and powerful uh, convening um, at Aspen. Um, so I'm gonna, this is, I'm just gonna kick off with a question and I'd like each of you to address it, which is, you know, all of you um, have been groundbreaking leaders on the path to gender equality. And there are so many firsts among you and, and Stacy really detailed so many of those for each one of you. Um, you know, we, while we recognize that success is rarely based on personal characteristics alone. You know, I do want to ask you what personal qualities or capacities were really most instrumental to your success or to the journey that you were on and, and why? And maybe um, I will just start. Madeline, since um, this is the Albright Institute, I'm going to start with you. Well, thank you. And uh, since I am the oldest here, uh, part of the issue when I graduated um, in 1959, uh, believe it or not, our commencement speaker, who was Neil McElroy, the Secretary of Defense at the time, because his daughter was in our class. Uh, and the stunning part was what he said, which was, uh, your main responsibility is to get married and raise children. The fact that we didn't walk out is kind of uh, uh, unbelievable, <laughs> frankly. Um, and so the thing was, I, I waited quite a long time to get married, three days after graduation. Uh, and about my, the thing that made it possible for me to move forward in life was that I, even though I knew that I had learned a lot at Wellesley and I felt comfortable with what I knew, I also was very prepared to do anything that I was asked. And I decided that the main thing that would make me useful uh, was to be somebody that was willing to do any number of things and to be dependable. I thought, you know, uh, if you are asked to do something, do it, and then make sure that you actually do the job. Uh, and I think to be flexible, I think that is also an important part. There is no way exactly to explain how weird life was uh, at that stage in, uh, in America. Uh, there were more and more women out there, but still, um, there, it really was not a simple issue to make yourself known. And I had started out and I wanted to be a journalist. I actually was one of the editors of Wellesley News. Um, and then I was having dinner with my husband's uh, managing editor and he looked at me and he said, so what are you gonna do, honey? I said, I'm gonna work on a newspaper. And he said, I don't think so. You can't work on the same paper as your husband. Uh, and so find something else to do. And instead of saying what some of you might say or what I might say today, I saluted and found it something else to do. And, and I really, that flexibility, I think is the important part and to keep moving forward and then ultimately listening. I think that is one of the most important aspects of being able to move forward. Well, I know it was a blow at the time, Madeline, but, but we thank him because um, maybe it, led you to this path and you, know, you never know how things are going to turn out uh, but but I think flexibility and listening two important two important characteristics um, Mayu I'm going to turn to you next oh thank you so very much I first of all want to thank you President Johnson Paula the same as Stacy and Rebecca for what you're doing at Wesley and the Institute which is definitely a milestone for so many alumni in global affairs, but especially to you, my dear friend, Madeline, for having not only at this moment, you know, requested our presence here, but you have been that guiding star for so many decades, for many of us who were, as I was, the first female foreign minister in my country, in El Salvador, where I was born in El Salvador, in a macho society. When I graduated from high school, the counselor downgraded me to second place, even though I knew 
I had first place. And when I challenged him and I said, it can't be, he said, yes, you're right. You have the highest GPA, but you're a woman. You won't need it. You know, so we gave it to a boy that, that because he will be going to, you know, the best university he can with that first place. When I went home and asked my father, please go and defend this, this is an injustice. He just looked at me and said, but he's right. You're just a woman. The only thing you'll do is get married. So I had to fight myself. I graduated tied in first place. But at 17, I did as my father said and went to Europe where I got an education as has been stated. I went to the University of Geneva, then went to the Sorbonne, but then I had the clarity on what I wanted. That was not my life. That was my father's life. And then I decided that what I had always wanted to be is a lawyer. So I called my, my father that time. There were no, you know, immediate communications via, you know, emails or WhatsApp or whatever. But I called him and I said, I'm going back home and I want to be a lawyer. And he said, but you won't have my support. And I said, I don't mind. So I came back to El Salvador and paid my way through university working for what was important for me then to be able to succeed was clarity on what I wanted, passion and determination on where I was moving. Then the war started in El Salvador, a very tragic civil war started in 79. And the way that the guerrillas would garnish resources was by kidnapping and they would only kidnap men. So my family's men, my father, my brothers, they had to leave the country because of the personal threats were just unsustainable. So who did my father turn to to leave all of the family businesses? Me, because in a macho society, you know, he could not give it to someone who was not blood. So there I was fully prepared with my law degree, with my determination and my perseverance. And I, that's where I began to work and so if you want a determination, you know, you have the clarity of where you're going and the passion, put that behind all of your efforts. And I would completely crown it as Madeline did with that cherry on the top, which is people skills, especially listening. Thank you. That is great. Thank you, Mayu. Um, Susanna, I'm going to turn to you. Thanks, Paula, and thanks again to you, the team, Rebecca, Stacy, and, and of course, thanks, Madeline, for having us here. It, you know, my story is a di little different from my use. I'm an only child. So I guess the, assuming that the only hope for the future my parents had was me, they put all their hopes on me, and they gave me this conviction that there was nothing in the world I could not do should I decide to go for it. So for me, that's the most fundamental thing that I have received that shape who I am today. That self-confidence, that notion that if I were to do it, if I wanted to do it, I would be able to do it. So that is very, very important. And that is something that I always tell parents that there is nothing more important than the trust and they provide their own children. So that's how I started. And uh, that molded my life, you know, that, that notion that not only I wanted to sit at the table, which is fundamental, I wanted to speak at the table. And I was absolutely sure that I could add value speaking at the table. And I prepare myself. The other thing that I, my parents did, they were a low middle income family. They were really convinced of education. That's the other element that I deeply believe in, education of girls. And they invested everything they could in my education. And I took full advantage of that. I really took full advantage of that. So self-esteem, education, Empathy that goes to the listening part that Madeline and Mayu referred to. The notion that you not only you want to make your case, you want to make your case listening to others' case so that in the end you come up to a common place where you have a shared perspective. 
that to me was another fundamental element that took me where, where I am. And perseverance, mm -hmm. you know, nothing comes, nothing falls from the sky. Things are the product of your effort, the work that you do day in and day out and investing in what you really want to do and being passionate about it. Because if you're not passionate about it, it's not worth it. That is, that is just so, um, I think, critically important words of wisdom. Thank you. And Margo, I'm going to turn to you last to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And also, this has been so interesting to learn about my, my former colleagues and, and now friends and, and sisters uh, and, and their stories. And um, I have studied my whole life, but believe it or not, I do not have a university degree. I wish I had had a chance to, to go to Wellesley and uh, experience all of this. But uh, my parents also, as, as I would say, um, almost poor uh, here in Sweden, they at least um, sent me um, in life with the message that you travel lightly with the luggage of education. So you, you, you must educate yourself. So I have studied, although I do not have a university degree, but um, I, I to what everybody has said here, I would add, um, you have to choose the right partner that will help. And why not a carpenter? Um, it's my own advice. Uh, and somebody that, that uh, can do practical stuff. But I think that the mix of passion and, and love to people, because if you have a, a job like the one we've had as former foreign ministers, you have to, to like people, you have to love people, whoever they are, you have to be interested in them, you have to listen to them. And mixed with, um, I think, a certain degree of anger over the injustice and the the, the wars and the conflicts and problems that you see around you in the world, but also with a sense of humor, because without that, where would we be? And I think this is also where Madeleine has always inspired me, because you have this uh, fantastic sense of humor, and uh, I think it's a sign of intelligence, um, because have you ever met a fanatic with a sense of humor? Uh, so I, I think that... Um, these are the things that have also steered my my choices. But when it was Mother's Day, I was thinking that I uh, am a link in that chain of uh, women's lives. You know, my grandmother who was very very poor and died young in tuberculosis, uh, leaving seven children uh, behind, uh, and also then my mother who had five children. Uh, but she lived until she was 90 and was lucky to uh, live through a time when, when Sweden developed economically and, and socially in such a, an amazing way. And then myself, uh, and I've had three children, unfortunately lost one also, but, uh, you know, with a life that they had never um, been able to even dream of. And... Uh, so I, I, I'm amazed over what uh, I've been able to, to do and achieve. And I think uh, some stubbornness, I guess my husband would say, also helps a lot. Margot, thank you. And thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry about your, for your loss. And um, I just think listening to all four of you, the perseverance, the passion, um, the empathy, the listening, I think it's, it's consistent across uh, across all of you. And I think a lesson for, for all of us and for our young uh, women here uh, at Wellesley. And now I'm gonna turn to, to young women. Um, you know, in recent years, uh, young women have really stepped up as leaders and change makers, both individually and also as a generation. Um, and we've seen this uh, for sure here at Wellesley and we've seen it for sure around the world. Um, and you know, how do we best build on that momentum? Um, and you know, Suzanne, I'm gonna to turn to you first because in your background, you have GWL voices and I know this is a passion of yours. 
Thank you, Paula. And I should say, the four of us are also part of GW Voices. So we have a lot in common in different constellations. This is a group of women that have come together, and we are 54 now, that deeply believe in two things, in gender and the gender empowerment, in women's empowerment, and multilateralism. All of us have worked in, in the world of, of the United Nations, of the multilateral system, and all of us are convinced that uh, the agenda of women empowerment has moved because of the existence of a multilateral system and the peer pressure that was put on so many countries and so many governments to enact laws that really make a difference. So that's why we are so passionate about it. And since the multilateral system is weakened these days, and in many parts of the world, the gender agenda is being pushed back, we, have, we feel that we have to join our voices, hence voices, to make the case uh, together about this central issue. Talking about women and young women, uh, we also believe deeply in intergenerational dialogue. All of us are more senior women, uh, and we believe that we might represent a view of the world that comes from our own experience, but we need to help shape a view of the world of the future. And you can only do that if you speak, listen, and really have profound dialogue with the younger women that sometimes don't have our voices, but have their notion of what they want to do. So we are pretty much into intergenerational dialogue. We work very hard. And what I would say we, sh we, we must tell young women is just to go for it, to really push the boundaries, not to refrain from making their case, not to refrain from thinking beyond the standard boundaries. Just go for it because nobody will really make something on your behalf if you are not totally persuaded that you have to do it yourself. So if you think about issues that you care about, if you think about the questions that, are, that make it different for you, for your life and for the lives of others, just go push and make your case. Great, it's, it's really such important advice. Does anybody else want to jump in? Any other yes, thoughts? If I may. Sure, Maya. Yes, thank you so very much. Yes, speaking on young women, young women in a generation where you can see, and I want to emphasize the need for eloquence and communication and digital media users. You have such an advantage over us, especially me in my 60s and not familiar as you are, where to you it comes natural. And let me just give you an example of the leaders and change makers. When we envision and see, for example, during the pandemic, the prime minister of Finland, mm -hmm. 34 years old, Sanna Marin, and she's a millennial. And what did she do to help her country overcome and cope with COVID? She used influencers in social media as game changers at times that was needed to fight this crisis of coronavirus. So she's, she understood that many people in Finland were not reading the traditional press. So he, she used influencers of different ages that became speakers at the time that scientific information was needed to overcome what you know goes around many times in the social media of fake news or you know, information that may not be guided in the best way. So with her example, I just want to signify and appreciate all that Wesley is doing in supporting the student self-development. And I would definitely emphasize the eloquence in communication and digital media users. Absolutely. And I just want to say, you know, we had a group of Wellesley students uh, engaged in the uh, in the youth conference that um, that GWL uh, Voices um, had, and and they did these uh, wonderful focus groups on a number of issues that were being addressed, and it was so powerful for me to read 
the the output i think the thinking and that that gust for really just going for it and also thinking about these issues in this three dimensional very intersectional way um, i think was also uh, so powerful um, so madeline i'm going to turn to you um, you're chair of the national democratic institute and you've worked to promote women's political empowerment and participation, including encouraging more women to run for office in the United States and abroad. Um, and clearly you've encouraged a whole, a whole generation uh, of, of foreign ministers. Can you share with us why the mission, this mission is so important to you and um, really what's at stake here? Well, um I find it one of the most important things that we do at the National Democratic Institute, where our general mission is to support uh, democracy. You can't impose democracy. That's an oxymoron. Um, and to look at what the institutional structures are required. And it's very clear that it is essential for societies to function well, is to use all the resources that exist. Mayu, I think the story about Finland is very important. And uh, there was a whole issue about how countries run by women actually did better in dealing with COVID. Um, and so the issue really is that I think governments work better uh, when there are men and women uh, who really are dedicated and can work together. The bottom line is there were in most countries very few women in office. Uh, and a little hard as an American to be promoting this since there are other countries that have had women presidents and we can't seem to get around to that. Uh, we have moved forward now with a vice president, but we also have been supporting <clears throat> women in all countries uh, to run for office to basically also help teach some of the uh, mechanics that are necessary for running campaigns and uh, how to work together. And then a part that has come up that won't surprise anybody, uh, there are a lot of countries where women who either are running or have already been elected that are harassed and their families are harassed. And so also at NDI, we've been working with the UN on a whole organization uh, called Not the Cost, that you don't have to uh, suffer for doing this, uh, and to really develop a sisterhood of support. But the purpose for doing it is I have found, and I found when I was in office, that it were very many times that it was very important to be able to have other women with whom to work, to cooperate, to understand. And so NDI really is dedicated to this. Um, and it really does help when women are trained in order to be able to uh, take the jobs uh, and to be um, capable and work on them. But it makes such a difference when there's another woman at the table that makes all the difference. And Susanna, when you were talking about speaking, uh, one of the real problems that I encountered and many people have is if you're the only woman at the table and you think, okay, well, I'll say this. And then you think, well, it'll sound stupid. So you don't say it. And then some man says it and you're really mad at yourself. And it makes a big difference if there's more than one woman at the table. It does, they, they've actually, shown right that that it's it's not even two but there have got to be three yeah three yep. um and you know it's interesting i i read recently about um the women who were uh who worked in the obama white house and uh attack that they would take and it was called amplification yep. which is i think we've all had the experience of having ideas taken and repeated as your own they would amplify each other's ideas at a table. And I just think, again, it is such a powerful example of sharing that sisterhood and really um, empowering one another uh, together. Um, well, the most uh, famous thing I ever said was that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. And I really, I believe that. And it was part, and it really is so clear how much older I am than my sisters here. But life was really weird uh, in terms of being able to put yourself forward. And in many ways, women are very judgmental about each other. Yes. Um, and I think we have to be careful about that and also about projecting any sense of inadequacy on other women. That's right. 
there's there's plenty of room at the table. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, talk a little bit about Afghanistan. And um, right now, it's clearly a country of focus uh, for those who are concerned about the rights of women and girls. And all four of you signed on to an open letter last year calling for the meaningful uh, inclusion of women in the peace process. Um, so why do women's rights need to be front and center in this discussion with regard to the future of uh, Afghanistan? And how do we ensure that they're protected even as the international military uh, presence draws down? And I'm gonna turn Margot to you first. Thank you. Uh, well, um, first of all, I think that we have to point to this as one of the few achievements uh, of international presence in, in Afghanistan, that um, we managed to um, get education, girls educated and create more life chances for, for women. And they uh, are playing an important role in Afghanistan. Um, but um, they also fear um, the Taliban's um, taking power and, um, uh, of course, um, instead putting up all of these uh, obstacles to, to women's participation. So for democratic reasons, uh, we need to ensure that women are fully part of a negotiation process, that they are involved in, in, in um, uh, the whole process from, from now on. They make up half of, of the country's population and uh, they are, as everybody understands, very, very you know, important to the development of this uh, country. Uh, and for result reasons, because we know that when women are engaged, you have uh, in negotiations, for example, you have more options on the table they will fight for social inclusion. You will have better results from that point of view. And um, I think that the international community will have to continue to uh, put the spotlight on what goes on in Afghanistan, not lose interest in what happens in Afghanistan from now on, and insist on making sure that women can continue to enjoy uh, access to education, uh, to be there around uh, the decision-making tables and in, in all of these processes. And we have to insist on that um, also in our contacts with, uh, with Afghanistan from, from now on. And we have to give them also, we have to listen to, to those women, continue to engage them and listen to them. And we know that in countries where you also put money in the hands of women, it is better used and better spent. So, so there are all kinds of reasons for why we should um, engage um, for, for women's rights in, in Afghanistan also from now on. Thank you. Any if, other thoughts? If, I, if I may, Paula, it, 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 Margot has described the case for Afghanistan perfect. It's not only Afghanistan. Afghanistan is sort of a flagship because of the current situation, the fact that there is a, a clear sense of the risk of, of going backwards. But whenever there is a peace process, whenever there is a, a situation where conflict has the potential to be solved and people sit to negotiate around the table, not having women there really puts the process at risk. Women are the ones, as, as Margot described, that see the options with a much broader scope, with, through a much broader lens, but also seek solutions that are more sustainable, that are more resilient, that are less a, associated to a short-term gain and more associated to a better future. And although this has been recognized and there is a resolution by the Security Council in this regard, Resolution 1325, the fact of life is that today women represent only a minor part of any of these negotiating teams. Leaders of these groups are almost nil. So is Afghanistan as a symbol 
that represents a need for any conflict situation to really have women fully represented and empowered. Um, and in, in terms of keeping that pressure on, uh, it sounds like you're really working as a group to, to kind of see a path forward, which in and of itself is powerful, right? And wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. Um, so um, just very important. I think one of the things, if I can add, is that um, I am very concerned that peace will be made in Afghanistan on the backs of the women. That they and that is something we cannot allow. And when I was secretary, I went to a refugee camp uh, on the border with Pakistan, uh, and it was all women. And they told the most unbelievable stories about uh, how they were raped and they had to jump out of windows to avoid, and people died, etc. And I, I knelt down with them and I said, "I will never let you down." And that has been, uh, I have felt some uh, necessity, but also guilt in terms of not really that we are letting them down. And I am concerned given what is going on uh, and ceasefires and various things um, that are, and the withdrawal of our forces um, that this will be made on the backs of women. And we have to keep our voices very loud and thanks to what Susanna has been doing with GWL, we really have been pushing on this in a number of different ways, but we can't all of a sudden say, okay, that's done because uh, it is not. And they have to be in the government and they have to be respected and all the things that are not going on um, as, as we seek uh, trying to figure out what the security situation is in Afghanistan too. No. May I add, Paula, just oh, to sure, say Martha, something that, of course, also the United Nations or the European Union uh, or any government that uh, now engages with uh, a new uh, regime in, in Afghanistan, uh, they have to insist to meet also with the women. They should not accept that it's only the, the loya jirka of, of men, but actually uh, also uh, the women that, uh, that uh, can be listened to. Um, and uh, I think we have to be very clear about, uh, about that. This is maybe also the chance I have to say that um, I, I served for um, a bit more than, than two years uh, as the special representative on sexual violence in war and conflict. And I have often said, and I keep repeating that it ga gave me a heavier heart, but actually also more hope for the future because to meet with these survivors, they all wanted to, to play a role. They wanted to lead their own lives. They wanted to influence their own governments and uh, uh, their, their, the future of their country. And uh, this was also the inspiration for me to introduce a feminist foreign policy in, in Sweden as the first country to, to do so. And I think uh, it's easy to argue for that because it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. It is needed. Um, it is simple. It's not complicated as everybody seems to think. Uh, and also it works. And we can show the, the results of, of this also after, after this time. But it means keeping, um, keeping asking the question, uh, where are the women? And it sounds like, you know, I mean, I think in, 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 in everything you've said, you know, going back to our first question where you're talking about the characteristics, your sense of really listening, empathy, and hearing the stories and translating that into the actual work that is uh, really at the table in terms of your policy and how you're driving this forward has been um, so important in order to just stop the cycle. And Margot, thank you for bringing up, and, and also Madeline and Susanna, that the sexual violence that you know, just over and over and over again is used as a, a, a really devastating tool in these conflicts. I'm gonna to turn to um, another issue and that's migration. Um, it's an issue that uh, has dominated the political debates in all of our countries. And each one of you has dealt with different aspects of, of this issue. Um, 
Margo, I'm going to, uh, Mayu, I'm going to turn to you first, uh, particularly being in El Salvador. Um, how should concerns for women and girls guide our approach to migration and refugee protection? Um, Thank you, Paula. Thank you so very much. As a Central American, I will speak on the migration caravans I am most familiar with, even though these concerns apply to migration all over the world. First is the root causes of migration, is understanding. First, there are push factors. There are few mig migratory flows, such as poverty, gang violence, weak governance, natural disasters. We just had the latest caravan from San Pedro Sula was 9,000 people who were ousted because of two back-to-back -back hurricanes, Eta and Yota, at the end of last year. And then we have definitely deteriorating economic conditions exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. But there are also pull factors. And that includes, for example, the recovery of the economy in the United States, where there are many jobs that are in demand that are not being filled at the very lowest level and family reunification. And also there is a perceived shift in the policy between the Trump and the Biden administrations that coyotes or people that traffic are taking much advantage, distorting that perception. So men have historically been the ones to migrate, but because of all these um, you know, push and pull factors, we're seeing an increase of women and girls also moving in the caravans and the migration routes. I personally walked this route to denounce human rights abuses. I went from Salvador through Guatemala, to the southern border of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded by women and girls who would end up in brothels, sold for prostitution, mm -hmm. in slavery working, kidnapped for ransom. I met some women who confessed that they had started taking the pill before embarking on the perilous trip as they knew they would be raped. Mm -hmm. So I do believe concerns for women and girls have to guide our approach to migration and refugee protection because they are in a more vulnerable situation. So we need a joint, you know, North America, Central America regional framework that enhances support for humanitarian relief and assistance. And together with Madeline and Lloyd Axworthy, who's the president of the World Refugee Council, we believe that a non-governmental forum that's composed of academics, of social and business leaders, and former policymakers can enthrall in a dialogue with current government officials to facilitate a more broadly driven solution that could bring a stop to this crisis. So this initiative, you know, that is outside of governing auspices, it includes channels of communication that support policy, especially regarding women and girls protection because of their vulnerability. That is, um, so Maya, do you, do you sense a momentum, a real will to, to make this happen? Yes, yes, I see more and more in the sense of the recognition uh, of, uh, of these pull and push factors because you have first to go to the data and be able to work to undermine those situations that are causing this and recognizing, you know, the concerns for women and girls is becoming more and more vivid, specific, especially because of the work of many human rights groups are along those migra migratory routes and the denunciation of feminicides it, which is, has unfortunately been on the rise. There are books, you know, on the Laredo side of, you know, the women of Laredo, for example, by Teresa Rodriguez from, I believe it's Sumivision, uh, of those murders of, you know, women and mostly from the migration routes. So it is, uh, I believe, uh, because of, again, the global communication, but also because of the concerns and the awareness that we, we are having more actors, especially coming in from academics, from the business world that want and, and feel the need to make this difference. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Well, I, I think, it, oh, Margo, please, you go. No, 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 you... no, no, I have a different story. Go ahead. 
I just want to say that's amazing what you are what you are saying, Mayu, and also that you did that, mm -hmm. that you went on that trail to see for yourself. And I think this is something that I often hear from women uh, leaders that that that's the way to to work. And also, can I add something with students listening? Hopefully. I, I think that literature give you so much more also of, of information and understanding. And I read the book, American Dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've uh, read that novel, but uh, it's about those who, who try to, to um, flee to, um, to the US. And, and those kind of stories give you a fuller understanding of a phenomenon, a political uh, problem and challenge as, as well. So I just wanted to add that, but I I think uh, I was amazed to listen to you, Mayu. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I have to say what Mayu said, so moving and so clear about what needs to be done um, and um, the importance of never forgetting uh, that those of us that have been in office have a way of really understanding systems in a way to be able to push and figure out what to do. And as she talked about this thing that we're doing with Lloyd Axworthy, um, I think that, uh, by the way, in case people don't know, I am a total groupie and I keep connecting various dots of my life. And so I was very glad to see that we were able uh, Mayu and Lloyd and I. And then in addition to that, another member of our group is David Miliband, who's head of the International Rescue Committee. So there really are various networks. Um, now, if I do think the following thing, every country has a right to have um, nat their immigration led laws. I mean, that is something that is part of the system. Uh, we are behind in a lot of the things that are being done. Uh, we need to have new legislation on all of this. I think that the Biden administration was left with a terrible mess. There's no other way to describe it. They have a ways to go. Uh, and our woman vice president is the one that has been put in charge of a lot of the issues to do uh, with what is happening uh, with the issue as far as Mexico is concerned and then the Northern Triangle. Then just to connect continue the world of women, there is going to be help from the US in order to, people don't want to leave their countries if they don't have to, in order to get assistance into the Northern Triangle uh, so that jobs are being created there. And another woman, Samantha Power, has just been made head of USAID. And she came yesterday to our NDI board meeting to talk about some of this. So the various connections I think are important. I can't resist, however, a personal story. I'm a refugee. I came here when I was 11 years old. Um, and when I got to Wellesley, I wasn't an American citizen. I didn't become an American citizen until between my sophomore and junior year at Wellesley. Um, and, uh, and some of the students will identify with this. Now they all know what their SAT scores are. Um, and at that time we didn't, and I had to go and ask the Dean and she kept saying remarkable, remarkable. And I think she only thought that cause she didn't think I know how to knew how to speak English. So anyway, but I was very, very honored to become an American citizen. And my most favorite thing in life is giving naturalization certificates. And the first time I did it was on July 4th, uh, 2000 at um, Monticello. That was the home of Thomas Jefferson a former secretary of state. Um, and uh, all of a sudden I hear, I give this man his naturalization certificate. And he said, can you believe it? I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the secretary of state. So I found him and I said, can you believe that a refugee is secretary of state? Which really does speak to the US. But I have to tell my latest honor is that I have had my portrait painted by President, former President George W. Bush in a book that he has done about refugees. So who knew? Anyway, <laughs> I love it. That's a little wonderful. bit of humor here on a very, very <laughs> difficult subject. Very difficult. Is it too late ever to, to uh, come to Wellesley? No. Never. <laughs> <laughs> 
And we want to, uh, I believe me, as we wrap up, I'm gonna ask one last question, but, but one, of, one of our goals is gonna be to really get you here to campus um, because I think that uh, it would be so extraordinarily special uh, for us um, and uh, so let's and for us. try to make that, let's try <laughs> to make that happen. Um, but, you know, we've, we've touched on some very, very difficult topics and clearly your leadership and um, how you also bring your passion, empathy, expertise, but also bring others along with you to address these very, very complex and difficult problems. Um, is so evident. Um, I'm gonna just lighten it up a little bit because um, this will be the last question. Um, so just I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to look back on your younger self and what about this current moment would most surprise the young women you were, the young women you were when you embarked on your uh, career? And you know, I think I'd also like you to think about, um, if you think about the progress we've made, uh, on, uh, on women's issues in particular, what grade would she give us? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I can start, uh, Paula. Oh. Um, I, I'm not sure that young women will be surprised because I remember being a young woman, having my eyes open and ready to see, look, accept, uh, uh, embrace anything that was happening. So my, my sense of that young woman many years ago will be that she will be absolutely thrilled to embrace the change and to embrace the opportunities. So having said that, if she had to grade the advancement, I don't think that the grade will be very high. I think that we have come a long way, no doubt, but we still have a long way to go. And the fact that we have to emphasize these issues and that we have to, to keep these conversations and that we have to nurture the younger generations with these questions is a proof of that. You know, when you look at how many women are president of, of, a, 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 of prime ministers in, in countries, how many women occupy CEO positions, it's a still a long way to go. Some statistics say that it will take more than a hundred years to get to gender parity. So a uh, good work, lot to do, and please keep focus. Yeah, thanks, Susanna. Margo, what are your thoughts? What would the younger you say? Um, she would say, what, didn't you, didn't you become a librarian or a teacher? <laughs> How come, what happened? <laughs> um, but I, I really think that, no, we cannot be, be complacent. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I served also as a, a minister for, for um, gender equality um, 30 years ago. And if I look back, actually the agenda looks um, almost similar, like the one today, you know, to fight violence against women to make sure that uh, the differences in, in salaries uh, is the, the, that gap is closing, uh, to um, convince men to take on another role and share the work at home with, with women, to make sure that women are represented, that they get the resources necessary, all of the things that are, and can enjoy the same rights. And women are still discriminated against around the world. They cannot, uh, they are not given the same life chances as, as men and boys. And I think that that's why we, we are still fighting, fighting on. And I think to show solidarity with, with other women, to join up, to create networks, to, to, um, to, to, to show solidarity, that is one of the most important things that we will have to ask also the students to do. And on that funny note, to, to um, finish, I think um, I was laughing a little bit because uh, there is a difference between former female foreign ministers or female foreign ministers. <laughs> and maybe that's the modern thing, you know, to reflect the bone, <laughs> which one is it? That's great. That's great. Thank you so Mayu, much again. Thank you. Mayu, any thoughts? 
Yes, thank you. Let me tell you, tell it with a story. When I was foreign minister, I became foreign minister in 1999, and I went to the United Nations for the very first time. I had my very first meeting, and Madeline will recall, we were only nine foreign ministers who were female at that time in a world of almost 200 countries. Wow. So we were definitely a rarity. And um, as I went into my first, very first meeting, and we would not start because someone was late. When he came in, I kind of signaled, you know, there was a seat right beside me that, because I, I needed to get going, had so much things to do, and my agenda was all already full. But he just looks down at me and he says, coffee with milk? <laughs> Why? Because what else would a woman be doing do in a United Nations no. meeting than to be there to serve him his coffee? Yeah. So yeah. I did that. I turned around. There was a little table. I put, you know, yeah, coffee with milk. I did. I put, you know, coffee with milk right in front, but I took my place. <laughs> and I also spoke my words. And that man just wanted to dive underneath that table. That was 1999. If, you know, now I see as, as a woman and not only look back on, on the accomplishments, but the opportunities that God gave me and also that allowed me, he allowed me also to be prepared for it. And that's why I cherish Wellesley and any other type of education that you get. Does, Margo, you don't need a title. It's, it's what you earn through education. And you prepare yourself so that when those opportunities arise, you're very there to take them. And I see my daughter. My daughter has a PhD in school psychology. And I see her also not only thriving in what she does, but she shares her, house, her housework with her partner. In my macho society, those things were not seen. Mm -hmm. And I see my granddaughter with no limits to what she can not only aspire to be, but what she will pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Mayu. Thank you. And Madeline, you've got the last word. Well, I think it's very interesting. Uh, and I already told about what it was like to graduate from Wellesley in 1959. And the interesting part was while I was at Wellesley because of a women's college, we had all the leadership roles. Um, the president of the uh, college government and the editor of the paper and all that. And we're prepared to have those kind of roles. And then we have this commencement speaker who basically thinks he's being generous or whatever. And we have all talked about it at our various reunions a number of times. Um, but I think mostly the way I would put it is that we were grateful to have anybody pay attention to us when I think about it um, and I did not push enough. And then finally, what was interesting, and this has to do with Wellesley, Hillary is 10 years younger than I am. She didn't have to be told um, that she you know, she was the valedictorian of the class. She spoke um, and she developed an incredible career. And that 10 years really made a very big difference in how pe women looked at each other and what we did. I think there has been incredible development and I have to, had been, if I could put it this way, I do teach and I had this uh, wonderful teaching assistant and she told the following story. She was a pilot. Uh, and she got on a, uh, this has a little do, reminded me of this Mayu, your story. And she was flying uh, a small, she was, she got on a plane and this was a congressional delegation of people that were going. And they immediately, as she was on the plane first, they asked, could they have water and various things? And then she gets in the pilot seat and they said to her, you fly too? <laughs> uh, you know, so the whole thing kind of, and she loved telling that story. I think the thing that has happened, however, and this is why I would agree on not a good grade, as Susanna said, I think things have gone backwards um, in many ways, especially in the previous four years. And I think the younger us and the young people now have to be very vigilant about that, how easily it can be pushed back and not every woman is going to help. My statement about a special place in hell, you know, I do think, and we have to keep very, very vigilant about forces that really do believe that women need to be uh, uh, at home. And our Supreme Court, just now, we were told they are going to review Roe v. Wade again. 
So vigilance, I think, is the important part and recognizing. Uh, and by the way, I was misinterpreted at something where I said there's a special place in hell about and that I was telling all women to vote for Hillary. I would not vote for somebody that I disagreed with, man or woman. And I think people need to understand, but I do think that we need to be vigilant. I think that is the most important part because it can be pushed back very easily. But yeah. to end on a good note, I do think that I am delighted and honored to be here with my sisters um, and to recognize what a difference it can make and so proud of what is happening at Wellesley under your leadership, Paula, really fantastic. Wellesley is ready for the next phases and the current phase because of everything you do um, with uh, an incredible faculty. And I'm very, very proud of, proud of the Albright Institute and Stacy and Rebecca and everybody that participates in it. Well, Madeline, thank you. We stand on your shoulders and the shoulders of all who came before and we look forward from that, from that vantage point. And um, we're gonna move to the questions, but I do just wanna say the power of the four of you here together, I think speaks really volumes of, as you said, the need to remain vigilant and the need to remain vigilant together as we organize to amplify our voices and the direction that is the direction we want to see the world move in. So thank you for all that you have done and critically important for all that you are doing uh, and will do and those that you will bring with you. So with that, I'm gonna to turn to um, Kyra Du, who is going to ask uh, a question live. And I think Kyra is here with us. Hi, thank you so much, President Johnson, or Johnson, and thank you for all the panelists today for coming to speak with us. I feel super thankful and honored to be able to um, speak with you all today. Uh, my question is directed to all the panelists. Um, as a Wellesley student who will be commissioning into the United States military after graduation, I wanted to ask you a question specifically around our future international security environment. What do you anticipate are some of the biggest international security questions and challenges militaries across the world will face in the next generation? And what advice would you give those leaders, specifically women leaders facing these problems, especially given the very heavily male dominated environment in security and defense apparatuses? Mario. Can I start? I think that the biggest challenge is the, the security concept itself, that we have to redefine security. Uh, and as human security, we've seen that with the pandemic. It has really raised all of the, the questions concerning uh, uh, human security. And I think it will have to be uh, encompassing uh, also all of these elements and, and it will have to be a more, um, a more, what do you, uh, what should, I, what word should I use it? You know, um, <clears throat> there are so many elements of, of security today uh, that you have to uh, include and to be able to discuss also where to invest. And as I see it, um, I think the US under uh, Biden-Harris uh, uh, has understood that you have to, what you do and invest also in your own country will uh, affect um, your role internationally um, and will have an, uh, an influence on, on the security environment. So, so that is really the, the most difficult thing to, to do because at the same time, we have all the old security problems so the more of investments in, in nuclear, we have uh, environmental and climate change uh, uh, effects on, on everything we do. Uh, so um, there's a lot to do for you uh, in, in the military uh, uh, and uh, in society. And if I may follow on that, because my thoughts were exactly along that same way, Kyra, security is no longer all of geographic boundary attacks or physical armaments. It's about biological warfare, about cyber attacks, disrupting every essence of modern humanity. 
And speaking of the U.S. specifically, you will have also on your hands the need to rebuild the foundations of American power at home. And this means getting the U.S. past the pandemic and getting a national economic recovery, which should strengthen the American family. And that means going back into everything that has to do in education, at the workplace, because that will truly allow you to advance the U.S. position from a renewed, strong position supporting and all which is needed at global affairs. But I am certain that you will be successful. Maybe one more thing also to add to that, that is you have to invest in what is called the first line of defense, which is diplomacy and political uh, and diplomatic presence and dialogue. And, and we have lost a lot of our um, capacity to do dialogue and to engage in, in those uh, uh, diplomatic efforts as, as well. And I think we have to uh, use some money also uh, to, to invest in, that, in those structures. My colleagues have said it all. Uh, the nature of, of, of conflict, the nature of, of, of security is changing as we speak. So the one thing that women leaders will bring into the security apparatus is a broader perspective. And I think that's absolutely critical to understand how that nature is changing and what the impact of that change has in society at large. So for me, the fact that women are now more uh, exposed to being part of the leadership of this security apparatus is central to have nuanced responses to a change in nature of security. Sarah, I don't know, which branch are you joining? Air Force, ma'am. Well, uh, and I think that uh, there are so many new opportunities and the whole issue of a space force and all kinds of new areas and everything that are there that have to be dealt with. Uh, and I think you will experience some challenges because in fact, uh, the situation in the armed forces is not um, as uh, uh, open to uh, understanding women as well. There is a new secretary of the army who is a woman, the first one ever. Um, and so I think you will have to, um, and you, I hope you're entering this with open eyes and I thank you for the service that you are gonna provide to our country. And then somebody will say to you what I just said about my TA, when you get in the airplane and they ask you for coffee and then you sit in the pilot seat, they will say, and you fly too. <laughs> Thank you. And Kyra, I just wanna also extend uh, my gratitude, our gratitude for your service. Um, it, uh, it's uh, just an extraordinary gift to the country. So thank you. And I do wanna say that we do need to connect you. Um, I co-chaired a, a major report uh, with, at the National Academies on sexual harassment in STEM, uh, academic STEM, which is only second to the military. Um, and uh, the person that um, we worked with is at MIT and she is a former secretary of the Air Force. So we will make that connection. I think it'll be a, an important one as you begin your journey. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to um, one of the, uh, uh, the questions from the audience. The first one is from Barbara Crane, class of 70. Um, and she asked, do the panelists believe that adoption of a feminist policy, foreign policy by some countries is making a difference? Uh, and are there good examples of the impact from countries that have claimed a quote unquote feminist policy? Let me chip in here before Margaret, because she is the one who started this. So she has all her respo the responsibility on her shoulders. Absolutely, it will make a difference. One of the problem is that there are too few countries that are still have this approach that are looking through a, a, a gender lens, their, their diplomatic approach, their foreign policy. When you look at what it means, a, a Margot said, it's not a big deal, it's not big work. It's a lot of work, absolutely. 
she was so convinced that it didn't, it looked like it was not hard work because the fact that she was leading the charge made a difference, but the system still reacts against it in, in, in general terms. So for me, what is fundamental now that the, the work that Margot started from Sweden replicates in all parts of the world. And I have to say Mexico, congratulations to Mexico has done it. Spain has done it. There are a few countries have, that have done it, but they're not enough to have a critical mass to really have a huge impact, particularly in the UN, where you sit all the countries together. And chapeau to Margot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. When it started with the conviction that more women means more peace. The fact that uh, the little experience we have of women being part of peace negotiations and signatories to peace agreements show that those agreements stand a better chance to last longer. So more sustainable peace if women making up half of the population are actually there and, and uh, taking full, full part of, of the work. And then we realized also that we had to, um, to work out those sort of parameters or the guiding principles for the work through our, all our embassies around the world. And that's when we came up with look at the rights, do women and girls enjoy the same legal and, and human rights, the representation, are they there in governments, in boards, on boards and, and in society in general, and resources. Uh, is there gender budgeting being done? Uh, what about resources going to, the need, to meet the needs of girls and women as well? And I think that has worked uh, really well to use those uh, guidelines and uh, we have a handbook for those who are interested in looking at how to do it and also the, some of the results and we've reported to our parliament also but I think now there are six or seven countries who have followed our example and uh, that's a good start but it's only a start that's for sure. Terrific thank you we'll have to get a copy of the handbook. Absolutely. Um, the next question is from Barbara Glassman. She's a parent of a student at Wellesley, class of tw uh, 22. And uh, in addition to having all of you amazing women as role models, how do you teach the qualities that all of you articulated that are important for young women to attain? Dependability, flexibility, listening, determination, self-confidence, um, in order for them to become a strong next generation. And maybe we should say, in addition to other than going to Wellesley College. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a compliment also of going to Wellesley College. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the in, it's the internships, it's the yeah. hands-on. And I think those type of experiences is what really drives those values and hone them in. I, I, used, I had an internship with a lawyer back in my country who used to be a member of the Supreme Court. And uh, I, I was an errand girl. I had to go everywhere and treat with so many people, you know, from secretary to CEOs, to bosses, to, you know, to whomever. And, and what he taught me and he said is you have to learn to, to treat, treat them as a person, ask a personal question. And I would say, how can I engage in a conversation? I don't know him or her, and I don't know anything about him or her. And he said, ask them about their family. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a family, you know, yeah. and that, and it worked. I would go in and, you know, had to hand the paper or pick up a paper. And I would say, hello, uh, como esta su familia? How is your family? Mm -hmm. And that person would brighten her day. You mm -hmm. know, people who had not, stopped to consider her a person and ask her something personal. So it was through that internship that I learned that human value. So I truly believe in a hands-on complementing your academic work. That's so powerful, Mayu. And I think you said something of it, something else that was very important, which was sometimes the jobs that seem at a, a very entry level where you're asked to do anything, they can feel lesser than, but take it and, and make something of it um, as well, which I think um, that that is a, a great example. Any, when any I have the privilege of addressing students, I, I tell them to do something unselfish. 
to join a project or to engage in an activity where they focus on, on the needs of somebody else. And uh, I, I think that this is important as, as well. It's along the lines of what Mayu just said. But we, uh, you know, we have so many selfish, selfies, <laughs> but we should have something unselfish uh, as well. Uh, because it will develop us as, as persons. Absolutely. No, uh, as, as dean of a school here in Madrid, uh, the one thing I, 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 I find compelling about uh, 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 engaging with the young generation, with the future leaders, as we like to say, is to really expose them as much as possible to real life. Mm -hmm. It's not only the academic content, which should be, of course, top class, should be absolutely a high quality, but it's also bringing in practitioners that show through a different lens how their life is going to be when they move to the real world. So being able to bridge between theory and practice and, and having people who bring different perspectives, I think is absolutely central to develop that, that developing that flexibility that is required, that capacity to reinvent yourself, to put yourself in the other's shoes. And I, that's something I deeply believe in, particularly at, the, at this young age. But this was a mother who, who asked the question, I will never refrain from saying everything starts at home. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I do think that one doesn't come up with all those uh, qualities right away, they evolve, and some of it does begin at home um, and other contexts. But one thing that I feel strongly about is, uh, first of all, when you first begin at a job, you are uh, in, and you're in foreign policy, you don't begin by making policy. You begin by making coffee, um, and I do think that these. And my, you, you were talking about. I mean. I, I made a lot of coffee and did a lot of Xeroxing. Um, but the main thing, and then uh, I have to say, when I became Secretary of State, uh, there were a lot of men who thought, how did she get to be Secretary of State? But whatever. But I do think the important part is not to be angry. I don't think that that helps in any way because then you have a rep, it doesn't mean you're not firm in your beliefs, but to go around being constantly angry, I think does not work. I think it doesn't help in terms of developing some of the other qualities that uh, are necessary for being able to work in a complicated situation. So stand up for what you believe in, but not harangue, I think that would be my advice. Thank you to each of you. And I think, you know, Madeline, those are really such important words because um, I can remember my mother telling me that anger is really that level of anger, anger that is inhibiting is really a use of energy, a, a, a real waste of energy. There's anger that can be mobilizing uh, to, to do more, but when it reaches a certain level, it can really be um, paralyzing and just uses up the energy that we need to use to do all the work that each and every one of you has talked so brilliantly about. So I think that is a perfect place to end. And um, Madeline, Susanna, Margot, and Mayu, thank you for just an inspiring conversation. Um, I think that you really have charted paths, each of you individually, that have contributed tremendously to the world, but equally importantly, the work you are doing together and with others continues to really push those boundaries of change that we so desperately need uh, in order to improve the world and particularly for women and girls. So uh, thank you. And I am going to turn it over to Professor Goddard to close. Thank you so much, Paula, for moderating this incredible event. I want to thank all of our speakers. You covered so much ground, and what you said was both so inspiring, so daunting. 
um, but really ultimately inspirational for all of us to keep up this work of working to teach global leadership and working to fight gender inequality. And I want to thank you, uh, thank the audience as well for joining us today for your stimulating questions, and we certainly hope to see you again at an Albright Institute event. Thank you very much. Goodbye, all. Thank you thank to you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.